Amen. Hey, Mark chapter seven is where we're gonna be this morning. I would also ask for your special prayers for me. I, I don't even wanna make this announcement because it's gonna be received so interestingly. Uh, today after the third service, I'm driving to Portland and getting on an airplane and then flying to Seattle. And then when I fly to Seattle, I get on another airplane tonight at 8.50. And then I fly a little bit west of here to a little island called Hawaii, no big deal. And, uh, and I land there at midnight in Oahu. And then I get another plane tomorrow morning at 6.50 and I fly to Kauai. And there's a little Bible college over there called Calvary Bible Institute. And they've asked me to come over there. Their teacher canceled. And they said, Luke, can you please come teach through the whole book of Nehemiah in four sessions to our Bible college students, please? It would be great. And I said, where's it at? They said, Hawaii. And I said, let me pray about it. <laughs> and it's so silly. Oh, poor Pastor Luke, but it's going to be a grind. I'm going to be in Oahu tonight, sleeping at midnight, getting it. So I keep telling everyone, they're like, oh, big deal. I'm like, dude, it's not going to be easy. I truly do need your guys' prayers and anointing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Someone say Amen. Okay, and when he calls us into crazy things, I just think of the Apostle Paul, I think of Timothy, I think of Silas, these guys who were on mission, and things would pop up and they would go, they would be sent. Isaiah, and Isaiah chapter six said, Lord, here am I, send me. And the proverbial question came up before Isaiah volunteered. The Lord said, maybe under his breath and out loud, who shall I send? Who's gonna go and speak to the nations? And Isaiah's like, I'll do it, I'll do it. And the Lord's like, it's not Hawaii, you know, but... <laughs> So be praying for me, but hey, take your Bibles now and join me in Mark chapter seven. Because man, we got a long day ahead of us, don't we? Mark chapter seven is where we're at. Uh, as a matter of fact, talk about a busy schedule. You know who had a busy schedule? is Jesus Christ. And we've been studying the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is a fast-paced, high-energy gospel. The fastest-paced and highest-energy gospel of them all. When Mark wrote this, he wrote it to the audience of the Romans. They didn't need a lot of details. They didn't need a lot of history. I don't even know if there's any Old Testament references or quotes at all in the Gospel of Mark because the Romans didn't care about the Old Testament, Moses and David and all that stuff. Matthew, when he wrote his Gospel, wrote to the Jews specifically saying, hey, Jewish brothers, Jesus is Messiah. He's the king. And so he constantly referenced Old Testament verses and pictures and points so they wouldn't miss it. But Mark's just getting after it. And so the picture that he paints for us is that Jesus is on mission. I say that taking it from verse 31. Let's read it together. It says, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of the Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Stop right there. Eyes up here. Again, Mark says, Mark wasn't there. You got to remember this. Peter was there. Peter told Mark. Mark was younger. Peter told Mark the whole story. And I wonder if when Peter was dictating this to Mark as he was penning, he's like, yeah. And then as soon as we were done at Tyre and Sidon, we kept going. And we went, here's a map I'm going to drop for you. We went from Tyre and Sidon, which is southern Lebanon, okay, right there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Tyre and Sidon, Gentile country, where the Syrophoenician woman lived. Jesus took them all the way up there, and I bet they were not happy. Happy. How many of you guys had parents that took you on road trips that you're like, what are we doing? <laughs> Joe and Arla, my parents took me to Canada to camp one time. I was like, hey, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> Way up. And it was like January. Anyways, core memories coming out. And they're up in Tyre and Sidon. And Jesus is like, let's keep going. And he goes all the way. Here's the Sea of Galilee. All the way through around to the Decapolis down here to the southern region of the Sea of Galilee. That would be like if you were in Corvallis, and I was like, hey, anybody want to go to Otis? And we walk through Newport to Otis, and you're like, dude, what are we doing? I don't know. This is crazy. And Mark says it this way. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Now, I don't want to take too much from the text that isn't there and develop a thought that's not accurate, but from what I can tell, Jesus is running an aggressive pace. He's on mission. You ever met somebody who's on mission? Like they're just getting after it. They're focused. They're ordered. They know what's going on. Have you ever met somebody like that that just doesn't know to, how to say no to many things? Maybe you're looking at one now up on stage. You, you see people, and I don't want to like justify my pace or my lifestyle too much, but I just see Jesus here. He knows for a fact, man, it's go time. Like it's go time. We came up with an acronym a couple years ago, a decade ago called YOLO which means you only live once. And it was used to kind of stamp the approval of people that were going crazy and doing, you only live once, let's go. And when I see this pace, it actually encourages me 
But let's be honest, we all go through seasons of our life where we're just really getting after it and other seasons where we're resting. We see this seasonally. The summertime and the springtime, things start to grow, things start to bud, things start to produce. And then all of a sudden, it's September 1st, and it's like, whoa, hit the brakes. We're about to go into a slow season here, at least in God's creation. So don't misunderstand me. I believe the seasons of our life are ordered by God. There's some seasons of intense fruit, intense taking the ground, going after it. And then there's gotta be seasons of rest, real rest, recovery. And yet in this story where we see Jesus right now, he's running an aggressive pace. And I just want us to acknowledge, I think our church is kind of running an aggressive pace right now. Don't you guys think we're running, it's crazy. Did you know that we're represented in Newport in five different specific locations? We operate out of the four square location. We have our whole church right here. We also have some offices by the FlexFit Chiropractic. We're all there. We got stuff going on there. We also rent the Newport Christian Church where we run a school with 22 staff members and over 100 students. We're renting somebody else's church doing that. We also rent a space at the Presbyterian Church where we're giving away food and running the pantry. And we're all over. We also own 12 acres in South Beach and we're building a multi-million dollar building. Man, South Beach Church is crazy. Someone say Amen. Why do you think we came up with a rhino for our logo? <laughs> you know, like, rhino's got to be tough. And again, I don't want to take too much out of this text. I do want to honor both seasons of our life. If you're in a season of rest right now in recovery, you're like, I don't know what to do, Pastor. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm behind. I don't want to put any guilt on anybody that you need to do more and show up early and stay late and say yes to everything and get in this guilty complex. I don't want to put any of that on anybody. I would say this, though. The second rule of thermodynamics is that everything is going from order to disorder unless a greater source of energy is applied to that matter. (sighs) How does that matter? What it means is if you're not doing something, you're probably going to just by nature do nothing. If you're not stepping into the next thing that God has for you, and maybe it is a specific scheduled season of rest and you're doing it on purpose. Have you ever met somebody who's purposely taking a sabbatical? So cool. Taking a vacation, I'm on purpose doing nothing right now. Good job. The tendency, though, is to not necessarily purposely do nothing, but haphazardly do nothing. Well, I'm just not pressing into relationships. I'm not pressing into the things of God. I'm not memorizing scripture right now. I'm not evangelizing my friends. I'm not going from Tyre and Sidon to the region of get Decapolis. I'm not doing anything right now because that's the nature if we're not careful to ask God, ask our spouse, ask our friends, ask our four is more, ask our life group, ask the board and the elders of the church, ask the pastors, hey, what should I be doing? God gives us the desires of our heart. So please don't pretend, or or I'm sorry, that's not the right word. Don't hear me saying that you should just make stuff up and do stuff. But I know my tendency is that if I don't hear from the Lord, I'm probably not gonna do the next right thing. Here Jesus is running an aggressive pace and he leaves and I guarantee you the boys are like, what are we doing? Walking all the way around. Jesus is on mission in order to seek and to save the lost. And he's setting an example Have you guys read the book of Acts and studied the first church? The women's Bible study is about to do that starting on September 18th at 10 a.m., the early church. And you'll see the missions of Paul and Peter and James and John as they go out and about and get the salt out of the shaker. And I just wanna be stirred up in that. I don't wanna look at the school and the building and the offices and the food pantry and the church here and all the things that we're doing, say, man, it's too much. We're just doing too much or going to Oahu tonight. I'll be sleeping in Hawaii tonight. I'm still wrapping my mind around that. It's too much. It is too much. But without me, he won't. Without him, I can't. This is that fine balance. Don't try and do everything without him. (laughs) That's burnout. Don't try and do the things that you want to do. And he says, no, that's not for you. Don't do that. Watch me. And we do it anyways. Uh, Don't do that. But instead, like the seasons, no. As the sun changes its direction and the flowers and the plants and the trees say, okay, we're going into a season, guys. God will direct you also with his still small voice. But be that as it may, I think this is a big deal. And I wish I could show you the map. You can look it up later. Verse 31, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Before I move on, I want to make this practical for you, though. Ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? Your pace can't be the same pace as Pastor Luke. Your ministry is not the same ministry as the person sitting next to you. Ask the Lord, Lord, what are you going to do in this next season? And he might just whisper in your ear and say, you're doing great. Do everything you've been doing. Just keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your kids. That's your first ministry. 
Love your neighbors yourself. That's your second ministry. Serve in the local church somehow. That's your third ministry. And God will show you exactly what to do. But again, the second law of thermodynamics says if you don't do that, you're probably going to be doing nothing. Let's keep studying this out. Just this one story is what we're getting into today. It says, then they brought to him, he's now in this region of Decapolis. Deca means 10 Acapolis is a metropolis. It's a city. It's a regional city. I'm not going to go into great historical teaching, but these 10 cities were Roman cities. This is Gentile land. I wonder if Jesus is teaching them a lesson going from Tyre and Sidon, which was Gentile land. It's now modern day Lebanon. By the way, I've been to Tyre and Sidon. When you get to the borders of Tyre and Sidon, you look over into Israel and everybody in Tyre and Sidon, everybody in Lebanon is super mad at everybody in, in Israel. And I've been there and I've been standing there with all my buddies He's like, oh, there's Israel, and they're all mad, and you just zip your lip. And then I've been to Israel right on the other side, and they're pointing at Tyre and Sidon and Lebanon, and everybody in Israel's mad at everybody in Lebanon. They're like, we're mad at everybody there, and you just zip your lip. It's crazy, the tension. Jesus took his boys there. He says, let's go to the Decapolis now. <laughs> this would be from one hot place to another hot place. Jesus, I believe, showing them a very important lesson. And it's going to be evidenced and it's going to be enhanced and highlighted in who Jesus heals in this Roman Gentile place where the disciples would have never gone had they not volunteered to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When you volunteer to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, usually the first thing we're volunteering for is going to heaven, not hell, right? It's not that hard. Like, who wants to be my disciples and go to heaven and not hell? Like, me! Who wants to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me daily? Uh, you know, back to question number one. And Jesus says, okay, now that you're going to heaven and not hell because of your faith in me, we're on mission now. Where are we going? Hmm. Maybe places that will be uncomfortable. Maybe relationships that will take a little bit more than you're willing to give. Maybe some areas in your life that you're gonna grow. It's not always gonna be easy and fun. And I believe Jesus is teaching them that lesson. We're learning it as well right now. And you only get one life. Don't be afraid of the uncomfortable. Don't be afraid of the things that are challenging to you. King David modeled this the best of anybody. When he would come into difficult situations, he would put a smile on his face. And he would recall and remember the faithfulness of God. He knew that God had led him, God had guided him, God had provided for him every single time. And I wanna have that same faithfulness and that same outlook that David had when things are stacked up, when things are big, because God hasn't changed yesterday, today, or forever. Someone say amen. He hasn't changed at all. And yet your circumstances, my circumstances, they're unpredictable. Well, check this out. Verse 32. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. Stop right there. Eyes up here. These Gentile guys had heard about Jesus. How do you think they heard about Jesus? Well, his fame was spreading. He was renowned, man. He was the talk of the town. But you'll remember a few chapters earlier on the shores of Gadara where Jesus and his boys almost died in a storm, got to the other side, and Jesus met the demoniac man. Remember him, the man from Gadara? And Jesus healed that guy. It was a powerful time, a miracle. And this guy said, can I get in the boat and go with you? And Jesus said, no, you can't. Go home and tell everybody where you're from what I've done for you. Based on what I can tell, he was the first missionary ever sent out, a guy who had had a demon, a guy who had all kinds of problems. And he went back to where he was from, this region, and started telling everybody about Jesus, both with his word and testimony, but also with his life and his story. People would see him at J.C. Markey and be like, no way, bro, and they would see his life restored. And when people see your life and you're different, you have a different mindset, a different outlook, a different trajectory, it's on purpose to evidence to the people around you that Jesus is real. You're not perfect, I'm not perfect, that's for sure. But our lives, our testimonies are to be different. Well, when Jesus shows up to the Decapolis, everybody knows about him. This is the guy that heals people. This is the guy that heals people. Ah! And so these guys go to great length. They find their buddy who can't talk and he can't hear. It's actually listed in the opposite order. He can't hear, therefore he can't talk. He's deaf and mute. He's unable to communicate. He can't receive and he can't give. We can all imagine the situation this guy was in. I'll just give you a little heads up. They didn't have any political correct police back in the day. This guy's life would have been very difficult. The abuse this guy would have endured. He would have been real low on the food chain there in cultural settings. And when Jesus is in the area, his buddies say, dude, you need help from the healer. And they brought him to Jesus. 
Now, it's interesting correlation. He couldn't hear, therefore he couldn't talk. And I don't wanna over-spiritualize this, but the same is true. Our hearing directly impacts our speaking in all ways. We see this physically, if you've ever met somebody with a speech impediment or a hearing impediment, that there's a direct connection there, but it's so true in our lives as well. If I'm not hearing God's voice, if I'm not receiving God's word, the logos, his written word, or the rhema, his spoken word, if I'm not doing that, I guarantee you my speech is gonna be impacted. It's gonna be evidenced. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You ever said something like, where'd that come from? And your spouse says, oh, I know where that came from, you know. Careful. What we see, I love this verse in the book of Acts where the apostles are getting in trouble for speaking about Jesus and they are commanded, don't ever talk about Jesus again. And Peter stands up and he says, what we have heard and seen, we cannot help but talk about. It just comes out of us. It's true though on the negative side, what you see and what you hear, it's gonna come out of you. If you're exposing yourself to all kinds of raunchy, worldly things, music and entertainment and all kinds of things that just amuse us, don't be surprised if the fruit of your life is a little bit wackadoo. This guy had a problem with his hearing, therefore he had a problem with his speaking. I love it in verse 32, it says, then they brought him to Jesus. Stop right there. You guys think this would have been easy or a little bit difficult? I'm just gonna go ahead and suggest it would have been difficult. Bringing people to Jesus is not easy. I'll make it even more spiritual. Evangelizing your friends, evangelizing your family, bringing them closer to Jesus is work. It's not easy. But these guys did it because they had faith in God and they had love for their friend. And I just need to be reminded of that because sometimes I get lazy in my evangelizing, my prayer life, inviting people to church, asking them how they're doing, how's your hearing, how's your speaking, hey, I can sense something's wrong. Sometimes I just TTP, I just trust the process and let God work it out. And the Lord says, hey, Luke, I want you to work harder in that person's life. Can you reach out to them? Can you text them? Can you call them? Can you love them? I promise you, getting this guy to Jesus was a big effort. But when they heard that Jesus was real, they didn't just put a shirt on and go about their daily business. They went around looking for people in need. This gives me great courage and joy to, 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 to leave today and drive to Portland and fly to Seattle and fly to Hawaii and then teach 25 students that I don't even know all week long, praying that God would bless them and anoint them, start a fire in them. Because we're gonna study the book of Nehemiah this week. It's incredible. The very first book I ever taught in my entire life was the book of Nehemiah. The very first book we went through in 2010 here at South Beach Church was Nehemiah to be able to go through the book of Nehemiah, a building book. You know, Nehemiah is one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament, never mentioned in the New Testament. Man, that guy is a picture, I believe, of the Holy Spirit, his heart for Jerusalem, his heart for rebuilding both the walls of protection and the lives of the people. And I get a chance to teach that, and it goes through me, and when I'm teaching that to these students, I'm gonna be teaching it to myself and receiving it again. When we evangelize, when we love, when we pray, okay, we're like funnels, you guys ever used a funnel for baking? You pour some maple syrup or molasses through that funnel or some sugar. Some of that sweetness sticks to the side of the funnel. And when you say, Lord, use me in my family's life, he says, all right, I'm gonna pour right through you. Woo, feels good. Lord, use me in Sunday school. Lord, these kids, these Sunday schoolers, I need to evangelize them. These kids need Jesus, amen, you know? And some of that sticks to you. I'm just gonna say, these guys had to work hard, but it was worth it. Notice what they said in verse 32 also. They brought him one who was deaf, had an impediment of speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him. This shows energy, effort, and intention. Now, Jesus was busy. Not only was he busy, but he had thousands of people around him. So these guys had to push to the front and say, Jesus, this is the one right now. We're begging you. I don't like that word beg. Do you guys like that word beg? It's kind of weird, you know? Yeah, quit begging. You know, you tell your dog, stop begging, you know? We want to beg. Here's the deal. The Bible says that our intercessions before the Lord need to continually be made, not just once or twice or thrice. Make your supplications and prayers known to him. I believe that that takes faith to pray for something, for someone in your family, to not see, we're Americans, to not see the prayer answered immediately like we expect, and then to smile and say, thy will be done. I'm gonna pray for this again tomorrow, Lord, and to keep praying, to keep begging for healing. Keep begging. Trust the Lord in whatever you're going through. Don't quit praying. You think the enemy wants you to quit praying? Anybody, you think the enemy wants you? <laughs> the enemy wants you to quit praying. 
These guys had energy behind their request, and they begged. Look at verse 33. And he took them aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers in his ear, and he spat and touched his tongue. Stop right there, eyes up here. What? Jesus healed a lot of people a lot of different ways. Mark's the only one who records this story. None of the other gospel writers wrote this story. And here Jesus in the Decapolis, Gentile land, is begged to heal this guy, and Jesus does some interesting things here. How many of you guys in your life could kind of skip the whole part where people put their fingers in your ears? Anybody want to skip that part? Yeah. What about the spitting part and touching your tongue? Anybody like their tongue being touched? Anybody raise your hand? No. I don't, I'm not into that. I just don't like that kind of stuff. And here Jesus did it, though. One thing I would say is that when Jesus healed people, he almost never did it the same way. They asked him. They didn't ask him for fingers or for spitting or for touching. They said, hey, can you lay hands on him? This is my method of praying for people, by the way. I usually don't go for the ears or the tongue. I'm not doing that right now. My method is also kind of just lay hands on people, hands on shoulders. Sometimes I'll touch a head. I've got some oil in my pocket. We're praying for people today, by the way. And uh, we're going to pray that God would heal people and that God would uh, set people free. And yet I don't think Jesus wants to be put in a box. And I don't think he's also advocating for the whole ear touching and tongue touching and spitting ministry. I don't think that's wise. When Jesus healed one of the blind men, he said to that blind person, he said, be healed. It was the word healing. So cool. Don't you want the word healing? That's what I want every time, just the word healing. One time, though, he told a guy to go and wash and he would be healed. Another guy, he grabbed some spit and he made mud and put it in his eyes and told him to go wash. It was three different times, three different ways. And I would just say it this way. Each of us are different in our journey. We all need healing because that's the only similarity we have. We all need a deliverance. We all need a touch. We're all in trouble. And yet when we package it and formulize it. This is why I don't really get involved in the whole healing ministries and people who say they have the gift of healing and attract crowds. You just don't see that with Jesus. Jesus did it differently every time. As a matter of fact, here, God bless you, he took him aside from the multitude. If I were Jesus, if I were one of the charlatans today, one of the healers, one of the people that are trying to amass followers, everyone look at me, I'm the one who knows what's going on. If I was doing that, I would say, everyone, watch this. It's gonna be great. You're gonna love this one. Watch this. And he spits in his face, you know, <laughs> you know and he heals him. But Jesus, getting vulnerable and intimate with this guy, says, let's go aside, just me and you. Okay, I'm gonna get a little, we're gonna get a little close today. And I don't want this to be a spectacle. I don't want this to get crazy. And in here, we have a bunch of points that I think are principles that we can extract Number one, we see the evangelism of his friends. You can write that down and ask yourself, what mission are you on with your friends? But here we're gonna see that Jesus gets vulnerable and gets close to this guy. Now, when these guys showed up to Jesus and asked him and begged him, they knew that Jesus was into healing people, one at a time. Sometimes I get it twisted, and I look at my own impediments, my own issues, my own stoppages, Sometimes I want, well, Jesus is too busy. I just gotta grind it out. I just gotta figure this out on my own. I gotta work harder and show up earlier and stay later. I gotta do more. And yet these guys, they believed, hey, Jesus, we got a guy who's all messed up. Please heal him. Would you heal him? And they're getting his attention. They believed that Jesus was into this kind of ministry. We need to believe this as well. Jesus had big crowds. We call this the air war. Lots of people. So fun. I love Sundays. The next service, I guarantee, is going to be packed. The gills going to be crazy. 10 a.m., week before school. Then people here, the third service is going to be packed. That's going to be so fun. But you know what's equally important as the air war, where we cover a lot of ground and do a lot of things, is the ground war. I don't want to say it's more important. It might be, though. That's what's going to happen later on today. I'll be solo driving to Portland, flying to Seattle, flying to the airport. That's the ground war, one-on-one, person sitting next to me, people I get a disciple, the people you live with and live next to. We leave here now and we go to the ground war, discipleship in our homes, evangelism in the streets, where we're at. As a matter of fact, it's fun to congregate together, feels kind of powerful, and it is, but when we get the salt out of the shaker and go into the highways and the byways and the hedges to the uttermost of the guttermost, I believe that's what the Lord wants us to be about. This church, our church, the church is more effective when we're spread out that way. As a matter of fact, some people have said that the church is like a big pile of manure. When it's all together and stacked up in a pile, it's kind of stinky, but when it's spread out thin everywhere, it's more effective and does what God wants it to do. Well, Jesus here loves the crowd, but he pulls this guy aside and he gets vulnerable with him. Not only does he get vulnerable with him one-on-one, but it gets kind of messy. How many of you guys think in the first century their ears were cleaner or dirtier than our ears now? 
cleaner. I think they were dirtier. I don't know if they had the kind of, you know, sanitization we do. I mean, even nowadays, you stick your finger in somebody else's ear, it's gross on both of your guys. We're like, yeah, we do it. Listen, this is real talk. In evangelism and discipleship and healing, sometimes it gets messy. As a matter of fact, if it's gonna be real, it probably always gets messy. It's gotta be vulnerable, one-on-one, really intimate. But the only way forward in real discipleship and real healing is if there's a real honesty and openness, and sometimes it gets messy. And I wonder if sometimes we're just afraid. I don't really, I don't really want people to know how gross my ears are, and I don't really want to know how gross their ears are. I don't want anything to do with this. And I want to ask you how you're doing. Please say you're doing just fine and smile and walk away, you know? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine, too. I'm glad we're both fine. See you, you know? And in my line of work, people pursue me in order to become vulnerable, in order to get messy. It's a blessing. It's a privilege to sit with people in their lowest days and they trust God and they trust the process. But I can't do it all, nor can our staff and pastors and leaders, but I believe God's asked us all to be messengers, all to be doctors, all to be the ones who say, hey, can, can we get close? I, I see that your, your hearing's messed up. I notice in your speech something's wrong. I just, I can sense it. Is everything okay? And you can lay a hand on somebody. We all have this power. It's so cool. Wouldn't it be rad if we said, dude, let's do this. What if, what if you came to church? Matter of fact, I don't want to embarrass her, so I'll just give you her initials. Her initials are Jana Ray. During the prayer time, we were praying in the foyer there, and Jana was in the foyer. She said, I'm going to go in the sanctuary during the prayer time and talk to as many people as I can. And it's my, my heart, I was like, oh, that makes me so happy that somebody would come to church on purpose to talk to other people, to get out of their chair. And some people come to church to get talked to, you're, you're, you're needy, you're hurting, and, and I get it, both seasons. But wouldn't it be awesome if every single person said, you know what, I bet there's somebody that I can minister to. There's somebody I can stick my finger in their ears. You know, don't do that. You know, There's somebody I can lean into and, and ask them, hey, how are you doing? And truly care. And if we would just grow in that, man, the church would be such a vibrant place. We hear from time to time, not always, we hear more praises than criticisms, but we hear people visit our church. I visited the church, nobody said hi to me. I visited the church, nobody looked at me. I hear that. I also hear people saying, I visited your church, it was so friendly and welcome. I'm like, yes, let's keep doing that. Let's keep reaching out. Well, we see all this, Jesus here getting vulnerable with this guy, getting messy with this guy. And we see Jesus here praying for him. Let's just read verse 32 again. Then they brought him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and he touched his tongue. Now, let me just pause again, because you probably have questions, as I do. Where did Jesus spit? It doesn't say. I don't know what your imagination says, But I believe what Jesus is doing, this is just me, you can come up with your own narrative if you want. I believe Jesus looked at this guy who couldn't hear and couldn't talk. And Jesus could have done this to him. And the guy's like, "Mm, not really sure what you're saying. I'm I'm a Gentile and you're a Jew. We're speaking different languages. I don't read lips. I don't know. So maybe Jesus touched his ears to say, this is what I'm getting at. I'm gonna, I'm gonna heal your ears. And maybe Jesus, instead of spitting a loogie or spitting his face, maybe he just went like this. And then touch his tongue, telling, communicating with him. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pray for your ears and, and your tongue. And he just a little spittle here and there. I don't know. That's how I imagine it. In those days, they believed that spit and saliva had medicinal value. It could have been that Jesus was nodding to the current technology of the day, the medical technology, which is spit. Which, by the way, you know that that's true. Your saliva actually does have physical healing properties. Regeneration causes all your tissues to regenerate faster. It causes antibiotics and enzymes, all kinds of crazy stuff in your spittle that God designed. They believe that to be true 2,000 years ago. Some pastors have developed this into thinking Jesus was into modern medicine and technology. I have no problem with modern medicine and technology, but it's not modern medicine and technology that heal you. It's God that heals you through the science that he created. And it could have been that, that he spit on his fingers and then touched his tongue. I don't know what Jesus was doing here, but I do know this. Jesus was communicating to this guy's deepest needs. Hey, your ears, you can't hear me. And your tongue, you can't talk. I'm gonna pray for you in these two areas. Oh, man. This would have been so healing, so comforting. Look at what happens next. Then verse 34, looking up to heaven, he sighed. And he said to him, Ephatha. That is, be opened. This verse 
is so deep. Jesus with this Gentile man who'd suffered his whole life, touched his ears, touched his tongue, and Jesus now just sighs. <sighs> this word sigh is only used in the scripture six times, all for deep emotional groaning and pain. I don't think Jesus was groaning for his own pain. I think Jesus was groaning for this man's pain. He sensed it. He knew it. The consequences of a broken world, of sin, decay, death, and dying. And Jesus, who's master and commander, you know, he bears this pain with this man, and he's about to heal him. He could have been smiling, you're gonna love this, it's gonna be so great, but before he did that, he sat with them in the darkest hours. I wish I had more power to heal more people. I wish I had more insight to give to people. Oftentimes what we have in our lives is just that ability to be with people in their suffering. I call it the ministry of withness. You're just with them. And something magical happens, something miraculous happens when you're with somebody in their time of need. I, I wish I could solve it. I wish I could give more years to Jackie. I wish I could fly to Lake Havasu with Savannah and pray for her mom. I wish people wouldn't die, but sometimes you just sigh with them. <sighs> and let God comfort and let God minister. Notice Jesus also looks up to heaven. This wasn't something he was doing himself. When we pray, when we trust, we don't look to our own self. And then he cried out, Ephatha, which is be opened. And immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Guys, can you imagine this guy's relief? This guy's just shocked. All of a sudden he could hear for the first time. When Jesus said, Ephatha, I don't know if this guy heard it or not. The prayer wasn't for the guy. The prayer was to heaven. Jesus was looking to heaven, to his father. And you and I have the same privilege, ambassadorship and authority to pray on behalf of others in their time of need. Let me just say something about prayer. Sometimes we get intimidated with our prayer life. Somebody asks for prayer, we're like, okay, uh, I'm gonna pray you get blessed. I'm gonna pray that everything's okay, but, uh, but God's will be done. And we, we kind of pray these like, you know, tiptoey prayers. We don't really wanna be authoritative. When you pray for somebody with authority, and maybe it doesn't in that moment even be answered the way you want. I believe that person is more honored though when you pray with authority and they're cared for as you sit with them and honor the impediment and trust the Lord for the healing. He's not asked us to heal people. You can't heal people. He has encouraged us and commanded us to pray for people and let the healing be in his court. This gives me great freedom. Pray with authority. Ask God to heal people. Don't tell God what to do. Ask him. Lord, would you heal this person? Lord, would you grant, Lord, life? Would you grant restoration? Well, in this story, he does all that. Look at verse 36. I'm gonna have the worship team come up. They're gonna lead us and we're gonna have some time in prayer. It says, then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well, and he makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Interesting correlation here. We don't know exactly why Jesus was saying, okay, now that you're healed, don't tell anybody. Most believe that it was because Jesus was controlling the chaos that was soon to come as his fame would grow, and he wanted to mitigate the suffering of his disciples as things would intensify, and ultimately his life would be lost and so he's like let's not blow this thing up but the more he tried to stop them from sharing the more they shared isn't this crazy he told them don't tell anybody they told everybody he's told us now in the year 2024 tell everybody we're like well i'm not gonna tell anybody <laughs> we do the exact opposite let me say something this guy's life was healed he was the witness and when jesus touches your ears and you hear the word of god and you begin to speak differently it's obvious to everybody we see this at South Beach Church. This is not a fake church. I'm not saying that, that, that any churches in our area are fake churches, but we're a church that loves Jesus, believes heaven is real, hell is real, the Bible is real, and that when your ears are opened up to Jesus, your speech changes, your life changes, your whole trajectory changes, and you can't help but show and tell other people. This is what we're doing. We're here on purpose. And if you think you're a believer and you say you're a believer, but there hasn't been an evidence in the difference of your speech or your life, then I just want you to go back and check out Jesus once again. Lord, have you changed me from the core to the floor? Lord, have you changed everything about me? 
Lord, am I a new creation? Are people saying the same thing about you that they were saying here? And they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Let's all stand up at this point. Here's the deal. There are men and women in this room right now that you've been touched. God's opened up your ears. My man Don has had his ears opened up. Nick over here has had his ears opened up. Lives have changed. Stephen's had his ears opened up. People have been changed by Jesus Christ. You're a new creature. Your life is different. Your voice is different. God's using you at this point. And what they proclaimed about Jesus, he does all things well. Isn't that the raddest thing you've ever heard? I do not do all things well. Our church does not do all things well. You do not do all things well, but our Savior does. And the message that you and I hold is one of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we're gonna do now, I'm gonna ask Pastor Rory to come up and pray for people. I'm gonna have Katrina stand over here if there's some ladies that need prayer as well. I'm gonna be over here praying on this side. And during this song, if you need prayer for healing, I really believe this is from the Lord. You don't have to come up and get prayer, but if you've been crying out on behalf of some impediment, some blockage, something going on in your life or somebody else's, I believe the Lord wants you to continue begging him to lay his touch upon you, to lay his touch upon that friend, that family member of restoration and deliverance, that Jesus would heal. And I'm even gonna go into intercessory prayer right now before we sing this song. Lord, would you grant healings today in Jesus' name, body, mind, and spirit. Lord, would you hear the cries of your people and would you pour yourself out liberally, Lord, with power that our lives would be changed. Lord, in Jesus' name. And maybe the healing touch we're gonna get today is just you sitting with us, sighing, bearing that burden with us, where we all of a sudden find that burden is less heavy, it's less crushing, it's less destructive, where right now we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Have mercy upon us now as we, Lord, move into this time of worship and response. If you need to come to the platform and kneel here and pray and intercede on behalf of yourself or someone else, please do so. If you need prayer, come to the left or the right right now as we sing and press into the Lord. Let's do this together.